Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Monday, May 8th, 2023. The first story at the top of antiwar.com today the Arab League votes to readmit Syria. So, this was on Sunday that the Arab League voted to bring Syria back in, and this marks a significant step in Syria's efforts to normalize relations with regional countries. Syria was suspended from the Arab League at the outbreak of war in 2011, and many of the bloc's members threw their support behind the failed regime change effort against President Bashar al-Assad. So this is a pretty big uh, deal when it comes to, again, Syria's normalization with all of the uh, regional countries. And some members of the Arab League opposed bringing Damascus back into the fold, including Qatar and I believe also Kuwait, but it's very few. And they did not send their foreign ministers to the meeting in Cairo uh, where the vote was held. Foreign ministers from 13 out of 22 Arab League members attended the meeting. Uh, so the Arab League Secretary General said that Assad could attend the next Arab League summit that will be held in Saudi Arabia later this month. He said, quote, Syria, starting from this evening, is a full member of the Arab League. And from tomorrow morning, they have the right to occupy any seat, end quote. So he also said that restoring Syria's Arab League membership does not mean that all states are normalizing with Damascus. He said that these are sovereign decisions for each state individually. And I know I'm pretty sure with Saudi Arabia, so the Saudis have kind of led this effort recently. They used to be against this bringing, uh, you know, Syria back in. But pretty recently, you know, coinciding with them deciding to open up with Iran, they have been pushing this effort. And so I know that As far as I know, they have not uh, formally, you know, normalized relations with Syria yet, even though they've held some pretty high level meetings. I don't think their embassies have reopened, but I'm sure we're going to see that soon. So Syria's problem now, I mean, it's its main problem is the fact that it's under crippling U.S. and, you know, other Western sanctions. That's the country's greatest impediment to reconstruction. And the U.S. opposes Uh, regional countries normalizing with Damascus as it prefers to keep the country isolated and they want to continue the occupation of eastern Syria. Secretary of State Antony Blinken expressed his opposition to normalization with the Assad government in a call with his Jordanian counterpart on May 4th. And this conversation came after there was a meeting in Amman between Syria's foreign minister and foreign ministers from four other Arab states that I went over in the, the last show. So according to the State Department in this call, quote, Secretary Blinken made clear that the United States will not normalize relations with the Assad regime and does not support others normalizing until there is authentic U.N. facilitated political progress in line with U.N. Security Council Resolution 2254, end quote. So kind of saying the same old uh, position that they've had, but there still has been sort of a softening in rhetoric from the U.S. on this issue. Because after this meeting in Jordan, a White House national security official said that the U.S. was encouraged by the meeting because they said they were going to resolve the crisis, you know, under the um, in line with that U.N. Security Council Resolution 224, which is pretty broad and vague. I mean, uh, that's why the U.S. and Russia, you know, everybody agreed to it in 2015. But still, I think that was significant, even though Blinken's kind of saying the same old position because it's during the, the week. Last week as well, the State Department um, didn't just, uh, you know, reject any engagement with Assad. They said, oh, it's an, it's good that they they said that, you know, that U.N. Security Council resolution is how they're going to do this. That's what we support. So I still think that that did mark something, even though Blinken is uh, saying this. But still, big deal. And, you know, this could eventually lead to uh, the U.S. withdrawing from Syria. You know, the, the Jordan and Saudi Arabia are going to be lobbying the U.S. to lift sanctions, as far as I understand it. And that could eventually lead to the U.S. uh, pulling out of Syria. So hopefully that's the end result of all this. All right, the next one here, Wagner Head says that Moscow promised more arms. So Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Russian mercenary outfit Wagner Group, said that he was promised 
uh, his fighters would get as much ammunition and weapons as needed to continue fighting in Bakhmut. The assurance came from Moscow after Prigozhin said that his forces would withdraw from Bakhmut on May 10th over the lack of support. The threat to quit the battle came after Prigozhin. He posted a video on Telegram uh, where he really criticized Russia's military leadership, went on a pretty long rant, and he was doing so, uh, you know, he was standing in front of dozens of corpses of Wagner fighters saying that, you know, they're not getting enough. That's why they're being slaughtered. And he posted a whole bunch of other things. You know, I was just browsing his telegram about how they were going to leave by May 10th. So he was saying they would hand over, you know, the areas they control to ru other Russian forces. Um, but it sounds like now he has decided to stay because of the assurances that he got. Um, you know, he's always kind of been critical of Russia's military leadership, but this was kind of, he really uh, turned it up a notch. Uh, but according to this voice note that he posted on Telegram on Sunday, Prigozhin said that he received, quote, a military instruction in which we were promised as much ammunition and weapons as we need to continue our activities, end quote. Prigozhin said that General Sergei Sorovikin, who led Russia's war from October to January, He's been coordinating with Wagner and the Russian military. Prigozhin said, quote, this is the only man with the star of an army general who knows how to fight. No other army general is reasonable, end quote. So I guess he likes uh, dealing with him. And if you're watching here, you can see the map. You know, Russia controls the vast majority of Bakhmut. Ukraine uh, controls some western edges still. The Russians say they control over 95%. I'm not sure the exact, you know, what exactly the numbers are but the fighting's still going on um and it's really brutal and a lot of people are dying it's just a uh, a slaughter in there the meat grinder as they call it and wagner has been doing much of the fighting in bakhmut pergozin has been increasingly critical of russia's military leadership as his force has taken heavy losses uh ukrainian soldiers of course have also complained about the lack of support from their military leadership ukrainian Ukrainians fighting on the front lines have said fresh recruits were being poured into the brutal battle with little training and ammunition. Um, so uh, just to, the the fighting over Bakhmut, over that city, continues. This battle's been going on for a really long time. Um, but it sounds like Prigozhin's going to stay. I mean, who knows? He seems to, you know, he might change his mind again. Uh, but the next one here, Russian novelist injured in a deadly car bombing. So Zakhar Prilpin, he's a prominent Russian novelist and supporter of Russia's war in Ukraine. He was injured in a deadly car bombing in Russia's Nizhny Novgorod Oblast on Saturday. So Prilpin said Sunday that he broke two legs in the attack. He was already on Telegram the day after the attack, but his driver was killed by the blast. Moscow blamed the bombing on Ukraine's intelligence services and said that the U.S. was also responsible. The Russian foreign ministry said in a statement, quote, responsibility for this and other terrorist acts lies not only with the Ukrainian authorities, but with their Western patrons in the first place, the United States, end quote. So definitely concerning to see Russia blaming the U.S., starting to just immediately blame the U.S. for attacks inside Russia, including that drone attack on the Kremlin. You know, they're saying something here. Um, so Russian authorities claim that a suspect detained for the bombing has admitted to working for Ukrainian intelligence. So far, Ukraine Security Service, the SBU, has not commented on the incident. So Prilpin was the third prominent Russian supporter of the war in Ukraine to be targeted in a bombing since Russia launched its invasion last year. Last month, Vladlin Tatarsky, he's a blogger and war correspondent, was killed in a cafe bombing in St. Petersburg. Then in August 2022, Daria Dugina, daughter of the Russian philosopher Alexander Dugin, she was killed in a car bombing outside of Moscow. The New York Times has reported that the U.S. believes the Ukrainian government was behind Dugina's killing. And I think it's pretty clear that Ukrainian intelligence killed Tatarsky or was involved in the plot and is likely, I would, you know, assume that they were also responsible for this car bombing. So according to RT, they had a little profile of this prial pin guy. Uh, he's known as a hawk in Russia. He's very hawkish. He's previously called for all of Ukraine to be annexed by Russia. He's a military veteran. He fought with the Donbass separatists in the Civil War. 
uh, that was sparked by the U.S. back coup in Kiev in 2014. And earlier this year, he enlisted in the Russian National Guard. So more attacks inside Russia. All right, the next one here. Russia evacuates people near the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant. So Russian-backed authorities in Ukraine's southern Zaporozhia Oblast have ordered the evacuation from areas that are threatened with shelling, including Enerhodor, which is the town where um, that's near. Sorry, it's the town where the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant is located. So the Russian installed acting governor of Zaporozhia said about 70,000 people in 18 towns and villages would be relocated due to intensified Ukrainian shelling. The evacuation order comes as Ukraine is expected to launch a counteroffensive that is expected to be focused on Russian controlled territory in Zaporozhia and Kherson. So this uh, official said, quote, we believe that a counteroffensive will begin very soon. We have information from the line of contact up to 150 kilometers deep, and we realize that it can happen in the coming days, if not hours, end quote. Uh, so if you're watching the video here, I, I just put in a map again from South Front. This shows the military situation in southern Ukraine, and it looks like there was some activity, a few Ukrainian attacks. And also this town, Enerhodor, on the this little tip here, this is where the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant is on the Dnieper River. And on one side, you know, the, the, the side that the power plant is on is Russian controlled and across the river, it's Ukrainian controlled. And this power plant, um, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, they have a presence at the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. And they said that their experts were aware of the evacuation in the surrounding town. The agency also warned that the situation at the ZNPP is becoming increasingly unpredictable and potentially dangerous. So Rafael Grossi, he's the head of the IAEA, he said, quote, I'm extremely concerned about the very real nuclear safety and security risks facing the plant, end quote. So the ZNPP has been controlled by Russia since March 2022, and it has been the site of frequent shelling throughout the war, raising fears of a potential nuclear disaster. Ukraine has tried to retake the uh, power plant. They've attacked it. And at least one time was confirmed by the Times of London. They said that Ukrainian forces attempted a cross-river raid to recapture the plant, which is on the east bank of the Dnieper River, and it was thwarted by Russia. The U.S. actually backed this attack by providing targeting data for the HIMARS rocket system. So the U.S. directly involved in an assault on what they say is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. All right, the next one here, Turkey rejects U.S. request to send the S-400 air defense system to Ukraine. So Turkey's foreign minister said that Turkey has rejected a U.S. request for Ankara to provide Kiev with the Russian-made S-400 missile defense systems that it purchased from Moscow in 2017. So he said that the U.S. proposal violated Turkey's sovereignty and suggested that Washington also asked Ankara to hand over the Russian-made system to the U.S. He said, just give it to us, I guess they, they were uh, asking. So he said, quote, they made proposals that directly affect our sovereignty. For example, give us control over it, give it to another place. Where is our independence and sovereignty? End quote. So the U.S. sanctioned Turkey in 2020 over the purchase of the S-400 system a step that has significantly deteriorated U.S.-Turkey relations. The U.S. also kicked Turkish pilots out of its F-35 training program. So Turkey's foreign minister said that Turkey does not want to rejoin the F-35 program, but they want their money back. Apparently, they spent some money on this program, and you know they didn't get anything out of it, so they want to be compensated for that. All right, I just want to take this moment again to mention that it is our fundraiser at antiwar.com and you know we really uh, need your support. We're entirely funded by our readers. We rely on you know the people that that get something out of this site, that read our, our website or listen to this show uh, to keep us going. That's how we're able to do this to provide you with all this news coverage from this unique anti-war you know, point of view that you don't really get uh, many other places. And right now we have matching funds. So every dollar that you donate will be matched. So you could double your impact. So it's a great time to help us out. So you go to antiwar.com slash donate to do that. And you can see the different ways you can support us. PayPal, cryptocurrency, credit card, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and you could set up a monthly donation, which a lot of people do. And that really helps out 
Uh, so anything, you know, you could afford every dollar counts and helps us out when, you know, we're funded by our readers the, the way we are. This is how we do it. And if you want to be involved, you know, uh, please help us out. And then when this fundraiser is done, we can just focus on providing you with all this news and uh, opinion pieces that uh, people find very valuable. All right, back to the news here. The next one, Sullivan is in Saudi Arabia discussing a rail project. So National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was in Saudi Arabia on Sunday to discuss a rail project that would link Middle East countries and extend to India via seaports. And this is according to a report from Axios. So the National Security Advisors from India and the UAE were expected to join the meeting on Sunday, announcing his trip to the region. Sullivan said that he would meet with his Saudi, Indian, and Emirati counterparts to discuss new areas of cooperation but he did not specify you know he didn't say explicitly that it was this rail project so the project is part of this is something that the u.s is pushing to counter china's belt and road initiative in the region the u.s has not been happy about china's relationship with uh you know saudi arabia the uae Israel as well, and it was first discussed at a forum known as I2U2, which includes the U.S., Israel, the UAE, and India. The Axios report said that Israel was not part of the rail initiative, but it could be added in the future if Israel normalizes ties with Saudi Arabia. A U.S. official told Axios that Sullivan would also discuss Saudi-Israeli normalization while in Saudi Arabia. But right now, Riyadh appears to be focused on repairing relations with Iran, which Israel isn't happy about. So I wouldn't expect anything like that to happen soon. And, you know, right before the Saudis signed this normalization deal with it, Iran, there's a report in the New York Times. I think there's also one in the Wall Street Journal saying that the Saudis laid out their conditions, you know, because the U.S. rewards all these countries that normalize with Israel. And the Saudi conditions were pretty big. They wanted the U.S. to give them security guarantees and sell them basically whatever weapons that they want. Um, so the Saudis are definitely going to be looking to get a lot out of the U.S. And I think they're in a pretty good position to negotiate a deal with the U.S. right now, the things that they've been doing. All right, the next one here, Sudan's warring sides meet in Jeddah. This is also in Saudi Arabia. So fighting and airstrikes on Khartoum continued on Sunday. So the fighting in Sudan is still going, uh, but representatives from the warring parties met in Saudi Arabia for talks to discuss a potential ceasefire. Multiple ceasefires have been broken and not respected since a violent war broke out between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary rapid support forces. The Sudanese doctors union said the fighting has killed at least 700 people, many of whom are civilians wounded thousands and led to millions of Sudanese and foreigners fleeing the country. Many have fled to Chad, Egypt, South Sudan for safety, while others fled to Port Sudan where they were taken across the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia. I know a U.S. naval ship was ferrying people back and forth there. In Khartoum, residents remained trapped in their homes and makeshift shelters with little food, medicine, and water as fighter jets pummel the city. So that's the situation. The fighting's going. Uh, and both sides have said little about progress of their talks since Saturday. That's when they got to Saudi Arabia for the talks. And they're just uh, trading accusations over, you know, who's breaking the truces. Um, so hopefully some progress comes of that. All right, the next one here, Japan and South Korea commanders tour a U.S. nuclear sub. So this is from the South China Morning Post. And I thought this was interesting. It's a very symbolic thing that happened here. U.S., Japanese, and South Korean naval commanders toured a U.S. ballistic missile submarine off Guam in a first last month, just weeks before the Pentagon announced that it will deploy one of the nuclear-powered vessels on regular patrols to the region. So again, th this is Japanese, South Korean naval commanders. That's symbolic because they haven't you know, gotten along very well, the Japanese and the South Koreans, and, and they're working on, on repairing relations. There's a lot to it, and I don't know enough about the intricacies of it to say if this is a genuine thing that's happening or if it's just their leaders kind of, you know, doing it so they can get more support from the U.S. But these are two countries that the U.S. is hoping to enlist in this, you know, new Cold War with China, even, and uh, 
they go and inspect this nuclear armed American submarine in Guam together. And they all look at it. And it's basically a message to China saying, look, we got nukes. We got allies in the region. Ha ha. <laughs> you know, that's what this is about. Um, especially the fact that they announced it. So because it, it happened on April 18th, but they did not announce it until until now. Um, the Seventh Fleet, so the U.S. Navy Seventh Fleet, which is based in Japan, said that the tour was an example of how the U.S. had advanced a trilateral relationship that was forward-leaning, reflective of shared values, and resolute against threats that challenge regional stability. U.S. Navy Rear Admiral Rick Seif said, quote, these submarines which patrol continuously provide a critical, stabilizing, and highly effective element of the U.S. nuclear deterrence. End quote. It's not clear if the Maine is the same vessel that will be sent to the Korean Peninsula because Biden said he's going to send a nuclear armed submarine to South Korea, marking the first U.S. nuclear deployment to the country since 1991, which is when they withdrew their nuclear weapons. So this is a big deal. And it's just a provocation to for the sake of provocation because U.S. nuclear submarines can be anywhere in the world. So they could be patrolling waters off South Korea, but he's got a docket in South Korea just to be provocative toward the north. Um, so one thing that was interesting here is that they quote a uh, Chinese analyst based in China saying that the U.S. was using North Korea as an excuse to deploy a nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine to the area, a decision that could be seen as part of the U.S. nuclear deterrence strategy to contain China from the north. And I agree. I think a lot of this is about China. And, you know, if Chinese analysts are saying that, um, that means, you know, the Chinese government is probably very aware of that, that th that's really a lot of what this is about. Because um, I, I don't know. I don't see any benefit the U.S. has to just escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, I don't know. But who knows? The, these people that we're dealing with. But if it benefits them in their little buildup against China, maybe that's why they're doing it. But again, uh, you know, they probably have their own reasons to keep things tense over there with uh, Kim. All right, the next one here. Australia's prime minister is frustrated that the U.S. won't drop charges against Assange. So Australia Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has expressed frustration over the Biden administration's efforts to convict WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, who's an Australian citizen, which a lot of people forget. The U.S. is trying to lock him away, even though he's not American. Uh, so Albanese said, quote, there is nothing to be served by his ongoing incarceration, end quote. And he noted that Assange had already spent a lot of time incarcerated as he had been held in London's Belmarsh prison since April 2019. And he's been confined to the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, before that, he was stuck in the Ecuadorian embassy. So Albany said, quote, I just say that enough is enough. I know it's frustrating. I share the frustration. I can't do more than make very clear what my position is. And the U.S. administration is cer certainly very aware of what the Australian government's position is, end quote. Last November, Albany said he personally asked the U.S. government to drop their charges against Assange, who is facing up to 175 years in prison if convicted for publishing information that revealed U.S. war crimes. That's really his crime is that he embarrassed the U.S., published things they don't want. And if he is convicted and put away, it's going to set a precedent that the U.S. government could, uh, you know, convict, you know, charge other publishers like the New York Times, any any media outlet for publishing information that they don't want out there. That's how you know serious this is. And there's been a lot of pressure on the Biden administration now, more from from Albanese um, and uh, some Democrats in Congress. Very few, but at least some. And the New York Times recently wrote a letter to the Biden administration with four European outlets that worked with WikiLeaks, telling them to drop the charges against Assange. So there's been this pressure building. But right now, there's really no sign. I haven't seen any indication to think that they're going to drop this, especially because on World Press Freedom Day, when they were asked about it, you know, they doubled, they they all, State Department, the White House defended uh, the fact that they had charges against Assange. All right, the last one here, a House Democrat introduces a bill to restrict aid to Israel. So a United States Congresswoman, this article is from Al Jazeera, a United States Congresswoman has renewed a push to ensure that aid to Israel does not contribute to abuses of Palestinians, particularly children, as progressive legislators continue to call for conditions to be placed on the assistance. 
So this was on Friday, and it was Democratic Congresswoman Betty McCollum. She reintroduced a bill that would prohibit U.S. aid from contributing to the detention of Palestinian children and to military activities that would facilitate further unilateral annexation of the occupied West Bank. She said in a statement, quote, not one dollar of U.S. aid should be used to commit human rights violations, demolish families' homes, or permanently annex Palestinian lands. The United States provides billions in assistance for Israel's government each year, and those dollars should go toward Israel's security, not toward actions that violate international law and cause harm, end quote. So, um, you know, this bill won't have a chance of passing in, through Congress, but I did think it was significant. Now, I know this was introduced last year, but I don't think it had as many co-sponsors. 17 Democrats, you know, it's a lot of progressives. You have the, you know, AOC. Is AOC in there? Actually, yeah, she is. And the squad, Ilhan Omar, um, and all them. But I think it's significant. I mean, I don't know. The fact that there's 17 members of Congress saying that they want to condition U.S. aid to Israel, I think, is a big change uh, just in recent years. Um, you know, I think that would, wouldn't have been plausible, if, you know, not that long ago. So hopefully this, you know, momentum starts to build. Uh, but that's it for the news for today. You can go check out our viewpoints. We have one from Ted Snyder, The Flight from the U.S. Dollar. We have one from William J. Astore, Nuking the Promise of America. One from Caitlin Johnstone over at her website. U.S. officials confronted about Assange hypocrisy on Press Freedom Day. One from Daniel Larison, U.S. military driving violence in Somalia. About a very interesting report from the Cost of Wars Project. And the spotlight is from Matt Taibbi, WAPO, and New York Times help overturn the Pentagon Papers principle. I think that has to do with, uh, you know, them hunting down Jack Teixeira. Uh, but that is it. That's everything for today. I hope everybody had a nice weekend. Um, again, please help us out with our fundraiser, antiwar.com slash donate, so you don't have to keep hearing me talk about it. Um, you could also, you know, if you can't support us that way, just, shit, you know, telling your friends about antiwar.com, sharing our articles around, sharing this show. You know, that's all a big help. Uh, but that's it for me for today. I'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for listening.